Katherine Halliburd is the award-winning author of Angelina Ballerina and a new collection of children's books about a lovable little fairy called Twinkle. Catherine grew up in a family of architects and artists in Chicago. And as a child, she loved to perform and dance with her three sisters. She graduated with a BA in literature from Bennington College and started writing children's books in 1983. Since then, Angelina Ballerina books have sold millions of copies, been translated into over 20 languages, and Angelina has become a children's classic. A few years ago, she delighted the children of Sleepy Hollow with a wonderful benefit reading from the Angelina Bar Ballerina series, complete with a real life ballerina. We are so happy to welcome her back to the Hudson Valley Writers' Center tonight. Thank you for all of your support over the years. Please help me welcome Catherine Holabird. Hi. I'm Catherine Holabird, and it's a real pleasure to be here today to read to you and to talk to you a little bit about my creation, Angelina Ballerina, who has been around since 1983 when I wrote the very first Angelina Ballerina book called Angelina Ballerina. Uh, my two children were going to ballet school. My daughters had just started ballet, and uh, they were five and three, and they loved to dress up and dance. It was just their favorite, favorite activity. And it took me back to my own childhood in Chicago when I was growing up with my sisters and how much we used to love to dress up and dance too. It's a very magical part of childhood. And when I had a chance to write a storybook, I knew I wanted to write about that character who loved dance with a passion and who was so adventurous and who had such a feisty spirit. And so Angelina came to be quite organically from my own life and my children's life. And I had the great good fortune, of course, to meet Helen Craig, the brilliant illustrator who has been working on Angelina with me all these years. And Helen and I started out doing something called the Little Mouse ABCs, her learning books. This was the first one we did a long, long time ago. And there were gorgeous mice. So Helen started out doing mice. Um, she's always been quite partial to mice. I wrote the script and she did that was marvelous illustrations. And then the publishers were looking for um, storybooks for Helen. Uh, and I went home and there were my daughters dancing around the kitchen and I thought I have to sit down and write something for them and for Helen. And so I, I wrote Angelina Ballerina very much at the kitchen table and Helen made a beautiful, um, il uh, illustrated it, I remember, in pen and ink and wash and she took it to the publishers. And the rest is history this wonderful character came to be. And we've made many, many beautiful books together since then. It has been a great and wonderful journey. And I feel so lucky to have uh, had this had this wonderful um, shared creativity and wonderful experience with Helen and with Angelina all these years. It's really been very special. This new edition is from, um, oops, Simon and Schuster, Angelina, is from Simon and Schuster. This is our new publisher, and we're, Helen and I are absolutely thrilled. They, as you can see, the books are gorgeous. And they, they're also doing a lot of uh, special specialty books like Angelina Loves and, and little uh, ready to reads and paperbacks, different prices. So it's a great publishing program. We just feel so, so lucky. Uh, so today I thought it would be fun to read the next book that Simon Schuster is publishing well, of the classic books, which is uh, Angelina and the Princess. Uh, this story, I, it was my second book, so it's very much the beginning of Angelina's uh, history. And this is a first edition that I'm reading today. There is a gorgeous new uh, Simon Schuster edition coming out in about a month, but I thought it'd be fun to read the first edition for you. Angelina and the Princess, and I hope you will enjoy the story. I won't be able to show you the illustrations tonight, but another time. And um, or you have the book and you can look them up, but sit back and enjoy Angelina and the Princess. Angelina was much too excited to sleep. The students at Miss Lily's Ballet School had been asked to dance for Her Royal Highness, the Princess of Mouseland. Mr. Lightfoot, director of the famous Royal Ballet Company, 
was coming tomorrow to help Miss Lily choose the best ballerinas for the special performance. Angelina wanted a leading part so much that she worked on her plies and her pirouettes far, far into the night when she should have been fast asleep. The next morning, Angelina woke up feeling terrible. Her head ached and her ears buzzed. Angelina's mother shook her head sadly and took her temperature. I'm afraid you'll have to stay in bed, she said. You can't go to ballet school when you're not well. But Angelina was determined to go. And while her mother was busy downstairs, Angelina packed her ballet bag and she tiptoed out of the house. Angelina arrived at Miss Lily's ballet school just in time to join her friends, Flora and Felicity, and all the other ballerinas who were waiting to go on stage. Flora did a nimble leap and a delicate spin, and then it was Angelina's turn to dance. Her heart started beating like a drum, and she couldn't remember what she was supposed to be doing. The music started. Angelina knew she had to begin. She tried one step, she tried another. Then Angelina began twirling and spinning like a top until she was so dizzy she lost her balance, tripped on her pink ribbons, and tumbled down with a thump. Flora and Felicity were given the leading roles in the dance of the flower fairies. Later, Miss Lily called for Angelina. I'm afraid you will have to take a smaller part this time, she said, trying to be kind. When Angelina got home, her mother was very upset. How could you run away like that when I told you to stay in bed? She asked. Angelina burst into tears. I had to go to Miss Lily's, but everything went wrong. I danced so badly for Mr. Lightfoot. I will never be a real ballerina. I'm not going to ballet school anymore. Angelina's mother hugged her and kissed her and carried her upstairs. And in just a minute, Angelina was fast asleep in her own bed again. The next morning, Angelina's headache was gone. She felt better, but she was still very sad. It's not fair, said Angelina. Maybe not, her mother said gently, but things don't always go our way. You can still do your best with whatever part you are given, and that will help the whole performance. Angelina thought about what her mother had said. Then she returned to Miss Lily's after all, and she rehearsed very hard with the other ballerinas for the royal performance. After Angelina had learned her own part, she memorized the dance of the flower fairies while watching Flora and Felicity. On the day of the royal performance, just as the show was about to begin, Flora tripped and sprained her ankle. Everyone was terribly upset. Mr. Lightfoot and Miss Lily turned to each other in horror. Who can do the part? they cried. Angelina was worried about Flora, but Susie stepped forward and said, Angelina can. Angelina showed Miss Lily that she had learned the dance by heart. But what about Flora? she asked. Oh, don't worry, said Miss Lily. We have a treat for Flora. So Flora was happy because she was invited to sit right next to the princess of Mouseland. Mr. Lightfoot and Miss Lily were happy because the performance could go on. Angelina was happy because she did the dance of the flower fairies without forgetting a single step. The princess of Mouseland was happy because she loved ballet. When the performance was over, the princess congratulated Angelina and thanked her warmly for saving the show. <laughs> and I thank you warmly for listening. And I hope you enjoyed Angelina and the Princess. Leslie Jameson was born in Washington, D.C. and grew up in Los Angeles. 
a graduate of Harvard College and the Iowa Writers' Workshop. She is the author of the essay collection, The Empathy Exams, a New York Times bestseller, the novel, The Gin Closet, a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, the memoir, The Recovering, and most recently, the essay collection, Make It Scream, Make It Burn. Her work has appeared in the New York Times Magazine, Harper's, The Oxford American, among others. And she's a columnist for the New York Times Book Review. She teaches at Columbia University and lives in Brooklyn. Many of you will have read her incredible piece on becoming symptomatic in the New York Review in the very beginning of the pandemic. Please help me welcome Leslie Jameson. Hi, my name is Leslie Jameson and I'm thrilled to be reading here tonight in support of the Hudson Valley Writers Center. I think like so many of us, I've been spending a lot of the past six months missing various forms of community, trying to build forms of community that feel possible in these days when our bodies can't be together, and just feeling a lot of gratitude and appreciation for all the ways in which people and institutions have been building community and community in the writing world for decades. And the Hudson Valley Writers Center does some of that beautiful, beautiful work around building community. And, and so I'm just really honored to be here supporting that work in whatever small way tonight. And thank you all for coming as well. Um, I thought I would read a short essay called Layover Story from my most recent collection, Make It Scream, Make It Burn, which came out a year ago, 2019. And the essays in Make It Scream, Make It Burn are about all kinds of things. And many of them actually are about strange, unexpected forms of community as well. There's an essay about the people all over the world who have become obsessed with the blue whale known as the loneliest whale in the world, a, a whale who has a singularly high-pitched song and has always been tracked traveling alone and has inspired everybody from a a Polish tabloid photographer to a woman recovering from a coma up in Harlem to sort of attach themselves to its story and find inspiration in, in um, its singular existence. Uh, there's an essay about kids who have past life memories and the ways that their families try to make sense of those memories. There's an essay about the variety of ways that people have built alternate lives for themselves online, including the virtual realm known as Second Life, where, you know, a woman who has multiple sclerosis can um, jump across islands in this virtual realm. A woman with legal blindness can uh, see the world more clearly, actually, when it's pixelated on a screen. Um, a woman who can't have children can raise a family. Um, and, and that essay, though, I wrote it several years ago, has come to feel really prescient in this time that I think we're all thinking about how to come together virtually, and if we're also hungry for days when, when we can come together safely in other ways as well. Um, in any case, Make It Scream, Make It Burn is about intimacy, it's about community, um, it's about art making, it's about the various forms that obsession bring us, the various ways in which obsession brings us together um, and, and brings us into the task of making art. Um, some of the essays are personal, some of them are critical, some of them are reported, and, and I believe in all those ways of, of being curious about the world and trying to document the world. Uh, the essay I'm going to read to you all tonight is called Layover Story, and it's, it's just about a 24-hour period and a chance encounter with a stranger, uh, and, and you'll see what unfolds in that encounter, but one of the things that I've been thinking about since the pandemic is that one of the things we've, we've lost or have had to reshape in new forms um, is the ability to have these kinds of chance encounters with the lives of others. This one happens on a, a layover in an airplane, um, but I think we're, we're missing them in all kinds of forms on the, on the subway, on the sidewalks, um, in the, you know, passage in a bookstore, uh, in, in the grocery store, in the bodega line. Um, I'm, I'm missing strangers in those ways. And so in this moment, reading this essay also feels like an homage to those 
moments of encounter with strangers uh, wherever and however they happen. This is Layover Story. This is the story of a layover. Who tells that story? I'm telling it to you now. One January evening, my flight got delayed out of Louisiana, where I'd been talking to people about their past lives, and I missed my connection in Houston. I had a night there. Trying to have a travel experience near the Houston airport is like trying to write a poem from the words on a yeast packet. Don't try to make it beautiful. Just let it rise. Let the freeways run like unspooled thread into the night. Blink against the neon signs of chain stores. Take shelter where you can. I take shelter at the Salmon Pink Hotel where I am sent. On our shuttle from the airport, I hear the voice of a difficult woman coming from the front row. She can't believe the bus will run only hourly the next morning. She can't believe her dinner voucher is for so little money. She needs someone to take her bag into the lobby. She'll also need someone to fetch it tomorrow. Later, at the hotel restaurant, her voice is there again at the table behind me. She wants her bag placed where she can see it. She wants her water without ice. She doesn't want to be a pain, but she really needs to know if the veggie wrap is absolutely 100% vegetarian. She wants to know about the other stranded people sitting around us, especially Martin, the German, and the Penn State math major. The math major loves pie day. The woman with a voice wants to know if she bakes pie for pie day. No, she just eats pie for pie day. What kind of pie does she like? All kinds. What kind of math does she like? All kinds. Well, okay. She especially likes patterns and sequences. The woman with the voice wants to know how she feels about eye to the eye. The undergrad doesn't know about eye to the eye. Oh, girlfriend, says the woman with a voice. Go look up eye to the eye. When she finally turns to me, the woman with a voice turns out to be a woman with curly black hair. She asks what I do for a living. She loves that I'm a writer. She tells me she wants to get into the interviewing business. Seems like she's already in it. Turns out she's coming back from a vacation in Cabo. Turns out she's on my flight back to New York. She suggests we protest the hourly shuttles together. The 4 a.m. departure is too early for our flight, but the 5 a.m. is too late. We should campaign for a 440 or a 445. She is a difficult woman from New York, trying to convince me that we should be difficult women from New York together. But I'm not a difficult woman from New York. I'm not any kind of person from New York. I just happen to live there. I just want to take the 4 a.m. shuttle and stop talking about it. It embarrasses me to be associated with her request, with her sense of entitlement, with these justifications. I hurt more. I need more, perhaps because I recognize myself in them. It's only when the woman and I walk to the front desk to check on the shuttle that I notice how she walks. The woman with the voice is also a woman with a body. She's limping. Once I notice her limp, I feel guilty about leaving her to make the shuttle request alone, as if it would be an act of abandonment in her hour of need to refuse her my company. She tells the clerk she needs help with her bags, and in the morning she will need help again. She explains that she was in a wheelchair at the airport. I bet she has one of those nebulous pain conditions where the pain is always moving somewhere else. I bet she felt like a victim before she ever started hurting. I am actually thinking these things, and I am someone who has written indignantly about the world's tendency to minimize the pain of women in precisely these ways, for precisely these reasons. We don't get our 440 shuttle. She's going to speak to her manager. She tells me she'll call me when she gets this sorted out. She takes my number. We trade our names. Back in my room, I Google the name she's given me. It's fairly unusual and involves a body part. The first 10 hits 
are all the same porn star. The next hit is an article about a stabbing spree on the Upper West Side a year earlier. A homeless man lunged at five strangers with a half scissors. The face of the woman with a voice is one of the five faces. I enlarge her on my screen. I try to remember her limp, which part of her was hurting. Five people, including a two-year-old boy, were rushed to the hospital after a man went on a nine-minute rampage. I picture the woman with a voice with scissors in her thigh or her knee or her foot, severing some nerve or vein and leaving her, a year later, still limping. When I see her in the morning, I won't tell her what I know. The etiquette of our era demands that we pretend we are still unknown to each other, though she will know I probably Googled her, and I will know she probably Googled me. But I find myself reframing everything I've seen her do, every complaint, every demand, every annoying attempt at small talk, as if a victim couldn't also be a solipsist. Now I want to read everything about her more generously in order to compensate her for the indignity of becoming a character in my story, the woman with the voice, when she was already another kind of character in another story entirely. The next morning, I try to help the woman with the voice as best I can. I carry her bags through the Houston airport. I offer to stay with her while she waits for her wheelchair. I barely grimace when she speaks rudely to the airport staff. She's been stabbed. She asks me to pre-board the plane with her and get her bag stowed above her seat. She asks if I'd help her get from Newark to the city once we arrive, if I can get her through the airport train station in New Jersey, through New Jersey Transit, then through Penn Station itself in New York. All those stairs and escalators and platforms and doorways and crowds and crowded baggage racks. I say, yes, 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 yes to all of it. She has a story and now I'm part of it. I'm swollen with virtue. I'm so swollen with virtue I can hardly believe it when the man sitting next to me on the flight wants to have a conversation. Doesn't he understand? My virtue has already found its object. I have none left for small talk with strangers. The woman with the voice is sitting in the front of the plane, probably making someone wish they were sitting in the back. The man next to me starts talking about driving his sister out to Texas, where she was moving for work. She's a traveling nurse, and they drove through an ice storm in Atlanta, and I really couldn't care less. This guy is just a kid, complaining about the Houston airport not having enough vending machines. I feel like his mother, as if I should offer him a snack. On the tiny monitors above us, a nature documentary plays. A baby bison is getting cornered by a pack of wolves. What will happen next? Only one thing we all know. Back home in Brooklyn, no one is waiting for me. I'm newly single and not so newly 30 and leaving lots of crumbs between my couch cushions from dinners made of crackers that don't seem like the dinners of an adult. Now this guy is talking about his tour in Iraq. He says, he got used to desert skies. Oh, his life is a little different than I thought. I don't know how to ask him about the war, but I ask him anyway. I ask him about the guys he was there with. That seems safe, possible. He shakes his head, the best crew of guys ever. Now here I am, he says, nudging his duffel bag, flying home with an army bag full of hermit crab shells. I ask how many are in there. Maybe 50, he says. He has a daughter, and she has four pet hermit crabs. I ask if they have names. They've got so many names, I can't keep track, he says. Their names are always changing. Right now, there is one named Clippers, and the others are Peaches. All three of them? Yep, just Peaches and Peaches and Peaches. He says they need a bottomless buffet of shells. They keep getting bigger, so they keep needing new ones. So the shells in his bag aren't hermit crab shells because they were made by hermit crabs, but because hermit crabs might someday use them. Yes, he says, that is correct. 
Perhaps there is profundity in this. We claim something not by making it, but by making it useful. What we squat inside can begin to constitute us. And now he's saying something else, something about the new aquarium he's building for clippers and the peaches. He's using old shower doors from his construction company. He has over 20 large sheets of glass, he says, and more than 50 smaller ones. And I'm trying to run the meaning-making logic over this one, too. We have the big and the small. We have more than we can use, but it doesn't yield. Houston all over again. And how big will his crab aquarium be, anyway? An entire city block? This guy can't decide whether to be interesting or not, like someone who is mostly late, but every once in a while, unaccountably on time. Why would I possibly believe he owed me interest anyway? Other lives are shells I want to scavenge only when the mood strikes right, only when the shells are good enough. For now, I want to know what these crabs eat. He says they'll eat pellets, but they prefer fresh fruit. What kind of fruit? Pineapples, he says. They love pineapples. He explains they have a lot of preferences. For example, they need salt water and fresh water. What about when they live in the ocean, I ask. How do they get fresh water then? He doesn't know. He says that's what I'm still trying to figure out. This man punctures me. I felt like his mother until he said he was a father. I think of all the fear he's known and the guilt and loss and boredom and how I don't know any of it. His endlessness is something I receive in finite anecdotes. Big desert skies, a little girl poking crabs. Sometimes I feel I owe a stranger nothing, and then I feel I owe him everything, because I forgot for a moment that his life, like everyone else's, holds more than I could ever possibly see. It makes me think of that David Foster Wallace commencement speech, This is Water the one that everyone finds inspiring except the people think, who think it's unbearably trite and find it pathetic that everyone else is so inspired by it. I'm so inspired by it. Wallace talks about the tedium of standing at a supermarket checkout counter, irritated by the other people in line, how stupid and cow-like and dead-eyed and non-human they seem. But, he says, you can choose to see them differently. You can regard the woman who just yelled at her kid and admit that for all you know, she might have just stayed up three nights straight with a husband dying of bone cancer. Maybe she just helped your spouse get through some tangle at the DMV. Maybe the annoying woman on the bus just got stabbed by a deranged stranger on her morning jog. If you learn to pay attention, he says, it will actually be within your power to experience a crowded, hot, slow, consumer hell-type situation as not only meaningful but sacred, on fire with the same force that lit the stars. My name is Lauren Akampora, and it's my pleasure to introduce Susan Joy. As it happens, Susan visited the Writer Center last fall, almost exactly to this day. She read from her new novel, Trust Exercise, which was at that moment a finalist for the National Book Award. We all had our fingers crossed for her, and I remember watching the live stream of the award ceremony just a few weeks later and screaming out loud when her name was announced as the winner of the 2019 National Book Award for Fiction. We're thrilled to have Susan here again with us tonight, and I'm happy to give her a new updated introduction. Susan Choi was born in South Bend, Indiana, and was raised there and in Houston, Texas. She studied literature at Yale and writing at Cornell, and worked for several years as a fact checker for The New Yorker. Her first novel, The Foreign Student, won the Asian American Literary Award for Fiction. Her second novel, American Woman, was a finalist for the 2004 Pulitzer Prize and was released as a feature film last year. Her third novel, A Person of Interest, was a finalist for the 2009 Penn Faulkner Award, and her fourth novel, My Education, received a 2014 Lammy Award. Her first book for children, Camp Tiger, was published last spring, as was her fifth novel, Trust Exercise. Trust Exercise was the winner of the National Book Award for Fiction and was a national bestseller. It was also named a Best Book of 2019 by The Washington Post, Vanity Fair, New York Magazine, Marie Claire, Cosmopolitan, BuzzFeed, Entertainment Weekly, Los Angeles Times, Elle, Bustle, Town & Country, Publishers Weekly, The Millions, Chicago Tribune, and Time Magazine. Of Trust Exercise, the Boston Globe writes, 
a rare and splendid literary creature, piercingly intelligent, engrossingly entertaining, and so masterfully intricate that only after you finish it, stunned, can you step back and marvel. Susan's nonfiction has also appeared in publications such as Vogue, Tin House, Allure, O Magazine, and the New York Times. She was named the inaugural recipient of the Penn W.G. Sebald Award and has also been a recipient of fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts and the Guggenheim Foundation. She is now joining us from Brooklyn. Please join me in welcoming Susan Choi. At last, the ends and the means seem to match. They have a new movement teacher who will teach them to move. They will learn to move by moving. They will learn to free their movements by free movement. The movement teacher's mission is so simple, Sarah finds it idiotic. There's something else about the movement teacher Sarah vaguely dislikes. She's not sure how to feel when she realizes her dislike stems from the fact that the new teacher is female. Mr. Kingsley, Mr. Brown, Mr. Friedman, Mr. Macy, who does set design, dramaturgy, and theater history, all men, Ms. Rozo will teach them movement. From the moment they meet her, they all disrespect her covertly. Something in Mr. Kingsley's gaze as he introduces Ms. Rozo warns them. They may mock her, but they'd better keep it quiet. She's a dancer and multidisciplinary performer, and she trembles with joy at the prospect of being their teacher. Teaching is a sacred trust, she gushes. You are the future. Despite their secret disrespect, they are secretly flattered. They'll give her a chance. Since their tryst in the second floor hallway, David has severed the wire. There's no longer even anger as a point of connection. His gaze backpedals from Sarah's like a magnet escaping its likeness. He has mastered the trick of existing elsewhere, even when they're in the same room. An alien lives in his body. Amnesia has sponged clean his brain. With each confirmation that David has vanished, Sarah feels more anguished and exposed. Movement class will be held in the black box. They arrive as the seniors are leaving, and Sarah sees David pausing with Aaron O'Leary. Aaron is a senior, petite and blonde, her flawless face grave with the consciousness of her preeminence. Aaron has a film credit, a SAG card. She drives a pale blue Carmen Ghia convertible. The sheer quantity of her superiorities is laughable. She's like an implausible fictional character. Her tiny body with its ideal tiny hips and tiny breasts and compact little ass drags generalized attention like a net. The boys, even the senior boys, fear her. She is rumored to date real established actors whom she meets on her sets. The girls loathe her. She travels in a cylinder of rarefied air, untroubled by her social isolation. She's only here because it's trashy to drop out of high school. Next year, she'll attend Juilliard. Where are you headed? David says to Aaron. Restoration comedy. You? Movement. Ugh, I hated it. We ought to get showers. Oh, you're okay, David says, to which Aaron laughs charmingly. She is so perfectly, adorably small that the crown of her glossy blonde head barely grazes his chin. She gazes up at him, contentedly submissive. A girl who can do anything she wants, can date a sophomore if she wants, anoint him. Sarah plows into the black box blind with revelation. Her cheeks, armpits, and crotch squirm with needles of heat, her familiar stigmata. 
Within the fist of her chest, her ribs snap like so many dry twigs. Welcome, Ms. Rozo is exulting. Welcome to movement. Right away, Ms. Rozo has them leave their chairs, their books and jackets and purses, and come down to the great square platform of the stage. Sarah has difficulty relinquishing her pile of books, folders, spiral-bound notebooks, the tattered, fractionally digested paperback of Tropic of Cancer on the top of the heap like a cake decoration. She has been pressing the pile to her chest like a shield or a bandage. She feels that giving it up will cause physical pain. Her chest groans at the fresh exposure. She can hardly stand straight. David is somewhere behind her. She can feel him there, looking at her, when she can't turn around and look back. Perhaps they're all looking at her. They all know her dilemma. Yesterday, trying to escape David's baffling absence, which she now understands. She'd climbed up to the fly rail and instead of solitude found Pammy, Pammy's face blotched and sticky with tears. 24 feet in the air, they'd had no recourse but to speak to each other, two girls, compelled by their classwork to a level of intimacy far beyond what they shared with the rest of the world, and yet also two girls who had never once traded a single superfluous word. You love him, don't you? Pammy had said. The black box was just as it sounded, a black box of a room with a large platform stage at the center, low enough to require no stairs. Four sets of risers seating on each side, and aisles around the platform and around each set of risers. During performances, black drapery made the aisles behind the risers into a backstage, but today the drapery is furled, the box is open to its walls and its faraway ceiling, crisscrossed by the lighting catwalks. Ms. Rozo says they are to walk, 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 move, move, move. All through this marvelous space, they must make themselves free to explore every inch. Not the catwalks or ladders, no. Laughter. All right, she says, you are all very clever. You will explore all terrestrial inches. In literature, there is an idea called automatic writing. You will write without resting your pen. The pen must keep moving and moving. Perhaps it is writing. Why the fuck do I have to keep writing? More laughter, shocked and charmed at her profanity. Her profanity, tinged as it is with her accent, is more charming than shocking. Is it possible they could respect her? Well, this unbroken movement of the pen unlocks the secrets within. And if the pen can do this, then how much more the whole body? Let your body lead you. Your only order to it, never stop moving. Otherwise, it is in charge. I will help you with music. Oh no. They can't respect her. It's perfectly ridiculous. The music she's playing, Cat Stevens, the moody blues. Satirically then, they walk, 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 making faces at each other, swinging their arms, bouncing on the balls of their feet, speeding up comically so they're marching like robots. Whenever Norbert and Colin pass each other, they make absurd faces. Then, when they pass each other again, they both make absurd faces and leap in the air, still without breaking stride. This behavior spreads, evolves. Most of the boys adore Monty Python and embarrass the girls at lunch with their flawlessly recalled and completely unfunny enactments of skits by which they, the performers, are slain with hilarity. In the black box, the boys do silly walks and then Pratt falls in motion to show they are slain with hilarity. By and large, the girls grow increasingly serious as the boys grow increasingly ludicrous. The girls no longer walk. They glide. They skim. They slice. The music changes to classical stuff without words. The girls begin taking on speed. 
An additional layer is added, high speed without hitting one another. They are weaving a mad tapestry with their movements, some unpredictably change direction in the hope of collisions. No matter what they do, no matter how subversively they do it, Ms. Rozo cries from the sidelines, Good! Move! 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 Ah! You are making something! Indeed, they are. Somehow, silliness dies. All the theatrical forms of movement, the silly walks and pratfalls, but also the arm swinging, I am carefree, and the deliberate direction changing, I am a rogue, leech out of the room. Unexpected collectivity has slowly emerged in its place. Perhaps most important, Embarrassment has been given up. Without their having noticed it, they're no longer embarrassed. Their speed has equalized until they're all traveling at about the same rate. Their winding paths, their clover leaves and hairpins and loops knit some underlying pattern. As if they learned this maypole dance beside their parents as children, as if it binds them to something and makes of them something. Sarah's face is streaming tears. At one point where she ought to curve left or curve right, she goes straight and plunges out the black box doors and down the hall, running, her speed snatching the tears from her face. There's a single toilet stall at the back of the girl's dressing room, off stage right, which no one ever uses except during performances. Sarah locks herself in and succumbs, her whole body folded and violently jerking as if she'll throw up in the bowl. Her mind startles her with the wish to be dead, to be dead instead of in pain. Suicide, she realizes, isn't opting out of the future. It's opting out of the present. For who can see more of the future than that? Reference to the future to its unbroken promise is the reflex of those for whom the future's mirage still exists. Such people are lucky, deceived. As if Sarah's thoughts had conjured her, Ms. Rozo comes into the dressing room and insists on discussing the future. Sarah cannot imagine how, apart from her own mind's self-defeating wizardry, this unwanted, hippie French woman could have located her here in this bathroom. Ms. Rozo is brand new to the school. More than half the school's experienced students and teachers do not even realize this bathroom exists. But outside the stall door, Ms. Rozo is saying, Sara, Sara, mispronouncing both A's the same way. Sara, are you in there? Are you in pain? Please leave me alone. Sarah sobs angrily. Why is solitude so fucking hard to achieve? If only she had a car, she thinks for the billionth time. She would lock all the doors and just drive. Thank you.